So in this video, we're going to talk about natural selection and talk about evolution and speciation, which is going to be the formation of new species. So we're going to start by talking about how many species are there. There are about 1.8 million different species described, and estimates are that there could be between 10 million to possibly even 1 million different species. If we look at animals, there are 1.25 million recognized animal species. Estimates range that it's actually probably between 10 and 30 million. There are 900,000 described insects, and of that 900,000, there are 300,000 described beetles. So just let that sink in for a minute. Beetles, there are 300,000 different species of beetles. There is a lot of diversity. If we look at plants, plants, there are about 290 plus species that are currently discovered. If we look at fungi, 75,000 different species have been discovered, uh, but estimates suggest maybe it's more like 1.5 million. If we look at bacteria, some studies have estimated that the number of species of bacteria is about 2 million just in the ocean and the number of species in spoiled soil to be about 4 million. The average hand harbors 150 species of bacteria, and the left and right hand share only about 17% of the same bacteria. And women tend to have more bacterial types. Interestingly, in a single gram of soil, we can have 10,000 species of bacteria. Even in the deep ocean, there can be 20,000 different species in one liter of seawater. When you look around the class, when you look at the human population as a whole, there is a lot of diversity. And so even within one species, you can find a lot of diversity. So how can we explain this diversity of life around us? A tremendous amount of diversity. And all of these organisms are essentially doing the same thing. They're obtaining energy to grow and reproduce. So how much, so how has so much variation come about and persisted over time? And the answer is evolution. There is a tremendous amount of diversity around us because organisms have evolved. Evolution over time has changed the way that organisms exist and so new species have come about as a result of evolution. And so what is evolution? Well, we're gonna be dealing with that in this lecture. And if we're talking about biology, evolution is like the framework of biology. If we were building a house, evolution would be the mortar. It's not just important to biology, it's actually essential to it. So let's start by defining what is evolution. Evolution is where we have the genetic composition of a population changes over time so that you get a difference in allele frequency. Remember that a population is a group of individuals of the same species living together at the same time in the same geographical area. So humans that live together in a general region would be considered a population. So how does evolution occur? One mechanism is through natural selection, a process in which organisms with certain inherited characteristics are more likely to survive and reproduce than our individuals with other characteristics. And as a result, beneficial adaptations are therefore gonna be more common in the next generation, and you see an increase in those traits in the next generation. So when you think about natural selection, you often hear survival of the fittest. And while yes, survival is important, it's actually more complex than that. It's not just survival that's important, but actually reproduction. Because even if the organism survives, if they don't reproduce, they're not gonna pass those traits on with greater frequency in the next generation. And so natural selection is about survival and reproduction. The organisms have to reproduce, which is what's going to lead to evolution. This leads to evolutionary adaptation, which is a population's increase in the frequency of traits that are suited for an environment. 
Now, when we think of adaptations, and we're going to talk about an organism's fitness, what you need to realize is that just because an organism is well suited to that particular environment, it doesn't mean that they're well selected for in any situation, meaning that in certain scenarios, that trait may be beneficial, but if the population changes, well, now that trait might not be so beneficial. So evolutionary fitness is something that is changing. It depends on how well an organism is suited for its environment at that time. And this is something that can change. So what are some examples of evolutionary adaptations? The first example would be simply uh, camouflage. So what you're looking at here is we have these different mantids and these mantids are an insect that have these diverse shapes and colors that evolved in different environments. Notice how each type of mantid blends almost perfectly into the background. How could an organism like this arise? The answer is that in each generation, the best camouflaged individuals survived and were able to reproduce, and therefore the alleles conferring camouflage became more common in each generation. One thing to be aware of is that natural selection does not create the camouflage allele. It's not like the organism goes, I want to blend in with my environment, so let me change my DNA sequence so that I blend in. It doesn't work that way. All natural selection does is it strongly suggests, uh, selects for camouflage alleles that arise by chance meaning that it puts selective pressure on organisms that already have that particular um, allele. And if the organism has that allele and it blends in with its environment, well, it's gonna be more likely to survive and pass those traits on with greater frequency in the next generation. Remember that in our molecular biology lecture, we learned that the only way that new alleles arise is simply through mutation. It is a random process. If the mutation happens to be beneficial and creates some new protein that is now useful to the organism and it allows the organism to survive better and reproduce, then that trait will be passed on with a higher frequency than another trait. And so each type of mantid evolved in their own environment and has adaptations that make it well suited for its environment. It's important to note that an adaptation that is favorable in one environment may not be favorable if the environment changes. Adaptations that seem perfect in one environment would be completely wrong in another. Let's say that humans came into the rainforest in Costa Rica and we cut down all the trees in the area to create homes. Well, if the trees with the leaves are gone, is the organism well suited for its environment? So notice if you look at the bottom here, we have our leaf mantid in Costa Rica. So if the trees are gone and there's no more leaves, is that particular mantid going to be well adapted to its environment? The answer is no. What was once a favorable trait when the environment changes is no longer favorable because if there's no trees, it doesn't have that camouflage advantage. And so this is this idea that these traits can be beneficial in different types of environment. And so if we have a different selective pressure at play here, meaning the trees are gone, and this organism is no longer suited for the environment, they would die off. And then this would cause a shift in the frequency of that allele in the population. While when the trees are there, that allele frequency might be quite high, if the trees are gone and the mantids start dying off, we're going to see that that population is going to decrease. And so we're going to get less of that allele in the population. And so this is just to show you these different types of mantids and notice how well they blend into their environment. So we have one that mimics dead leaves, right? So here's one that mimics dead leaves. We have another one that mimics um, a flower. And then we have the one that basically mimics a leaf. Bacteria are the ultimate chameleons since they have been here longer than any other life form. 
And yet it was only upon the invention of the microscope that we even became aware of their existence. And the invention of antibiotics is even more recent, yet look at how quickly the bacteria have evolved. The first antibiotic was discovered in the 1920s by Alexander Fleming. The first antibiotic was penicillin. And yet, if you look at the types of drugs that we have and bacteria becoming resistant to them, bacteria have evolved very quickly, light years faster than any mantid or chameleon. In some cases, less than one year to evolve. And we saw an example of this in the video that I showed you of the large plates of bacteria and they were showing the experiment, the Harvard study, where they looked at how bacteria could adapt and become resistant to antibiotics. And remember that in the video, we saw that within 11 days, bacteria became resistant to a thousand times the concentration of antibiotic, whereas they were once sensitive to the drug after simply just 11 days, they became resistant to up to a thousand times that drug. And so bacteria will evolve very, very quickly. So let's talk about antibiotic resistance. So when you think of the bacteria that are in your body, you have a very diverse population. You're gonna have some bacteria that have a low resistance level. Those are gonna be colored um, yellow. We have some that have a high resistance level, those are colored red, and then we have colors in between. And so we have this varying population within the body. If we think about our cells within our body, we have almost roughly an equivalent number of bacterial cells in our body as we do our own cells. And so we have a lot of bacteria in our body and they have varying varying levels of resistance. So let's say that you get strep throat. Strep throat is caused by a bacteria called Streptococcus pyogenes. And so you go to the doctor and your doctor gives you a 10 day course of antibiotics. And he said, take these for 10 days. So you start to take the drug and let's say that after a couple days, maybe three days, you start to feel better. And when you start to feel better, you decide you don't need the antibiotics anymore. You decide that you want to save them for when you get sick again so that you don't have to go to the doctor. I can tell you I have members of my own family who do this and it drives me crazy. There is a very important reason that you should not do this. You need to finish a cycle of antibiotics all the way to completion. Think about why that is. So if we introduce an antibiotic, right? If you start to take an antibiotic, which bacteria are gonna die off first? Are we gonna kill off the ones with a low resistance level or the ones with a high resistance level first? Answer is the first ones to go are gonna be the low resistance. So if we're scheduled to take a 10 day course of antibiotics, that is basically the concentration of the drug that has been shown to be effective. If we are prescribed a 10 day dose of the drug and we only take three days, the weak ones are gonna die off first, right? We're gonna lose those bacteria with the low resistance alleles first. So after the antibiotic's been introduced, if we don't take it to completion, what ends up happening is, is that after selection, meaning after the antibiotic is introduced, the ones that are gonna survive and hang around are going to be the ones that have a high level of resistance. And so this would be your population after exposure to the antibiotics. So now look what happened. You had this original population of bacteria and that original population had varying levels of resistance. However, if you start your antibiotic and you don't finish it to completion, you are killing off the weaker ones first. What you're now doing is you're giving the stronger ones less competition. You have gotten rid of their competition because normally bacteria compete for food, space, basically resources that they need to live. And so you have just gotten rid of their, um, their competition 
And so now the bacteria that are left are the ones that are gonna start to reproduce. And so what's gonna end up happening is when those reproduce, you're gonna end up with a final population that has a very high level of resistance. This is evolution. We have changed the frequency of the alleles within this population. And so now you end up with a population of bacteria that is highly resistant to the drug that was prescribed. And so this can be prevented by taking an antibiotic to completion. Because if you take it to completion, you're not just killing off the weak ones, but you're hopefully getting rid of all of the bacteria. And so we end up with this new generation with a new distribution of resistance levels. Now our population has a very high level of resistance. So key points when you talk about natural selection and antibiotic resistance, the antibiotics do not create the resistance allele. So again, it's not like that because the bacteria was exposed to the antibiotic that they then responded by making a resistance allele. It doesn't work that way. The variation in resistance was already present in the population. The presence of the antibiotic caused the resistance allele frequency to shift. So again, those red ones were already in our population. It's just that their frequency was a lot lower. When you get rid of their competition and you end up with this new population, now you end up with a population that is largely antibiotic resistance And so now you have a change in the frequency of that allele. And so this is why it's so important to take a drug to completion. You don't want to start your antibiotic and when you feel better, stop taking it and then save it for when you're sick again. It's also important that you don't take an antibiotic if it's not necessary. Because the more often we subject bacteria to that, the more likely we are to select for them. And so if you have, you know, a cold or the flu or, you know, coronavirus, for example, those are caused by viruses and the antibiotics are not going to be effective against those viruses. And so taking an antibiotic when you have a cold is not going to help you get better any faster, and therefore you should not take an antibiotic unless it is medically necessary. So question for you. In addition to not finishing a cycle of antibiotics or taking it as prescribed, which is what we just talked about, what else can society do to try and minimize the creation of antibiotic-resistant bacteria? So what what could we as a society do to help prevent antibiotic resistance from developing further. And so this is going to be a discussion board that you will place on Canvas. You are gonna put your answer in and then we can discuss the answers to this. So I want you to think about what else could we do to help prevent further resistance of bacteria to antibiotics. And so I want you to think about that and then post your answer on Canvas. So question for you, ferns require moisture to reproduce. What will happen to a fern population during a prolonged drought? Is it red to save the species? Some of the ferns will acquire the ability to reproduce without water. Yellow, if none of the ferns already have the ability to reproduce without water, the ferns might go extinct. So I want you to think about this, pause the video while you think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play. So the correct answer is yellow. If none of the ferns already have the ability to reproduce without water, the ferns might go extinct. So it's not red that to save a species, some of the ferns will acquire the ability to reproduce without water because evolution is not goal-driven. Organisms cannot make themselves have a particular adaptation just because they want it. That would be like saying that I would like to be shorter so that I could be a gymnast. I'm quite tall. I'm 5'10", right? I can't say, well, I would like to be shorter so that I could be a gymnast. I cannot just all of a sudden make myself shorter just because it would be a better adaptation as a gymnast. 
So the answer is yellow in the fern example, that if none of the ferns already have the allele that allows them to reproduce without water, then the ferns may become extinct. Natural selection can only act on existing alleles in the population, and mutations can only occur in existing alleles. So natural selection has to act on traits that already exist. Again, organisms cannot just decide they want a trait. It has to be something that is already present in that population. So now we're gonna move on and look at a history of evolutionary thought and kind of how did this theory of natural selection come into play? So if we look at kind of this idea of evolutionary thought, so we have the Greek philosopher, Aristotle, and he had this idea of what's called a fixed species. And that means that species are fixed or permanent and do not evolve. And so the Judeo-Christian culture fortified that idea with a literal interpretation of the book of Genesis. And that is that each form of life being independently was created in its present form. So God created the heavens and earth in seven days. And so that belief basically said that organisms are fixed and they were basically formed in those seven days and that organisms didn't change. So that was for Aristotle. Next came along a French naturalist, Georges Buffon, in 1749. Now, you do not need to memorize these years. I will not ask you what years uh, these different theories came into play. It's just to give you an idea of how long ago did these things happen. So Georges Buffon studied fossils, which are imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past. And he observed similarities between particular fossils and living animals. And so he suggested that certain fossil forms may be ancient versions of similar uh, living species. And so these species can change as they spread from their original location. Then we have the French naturalist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck in the early 1800s. And Lamarck believed that organisms changed over generations through what has been termed the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And so when you think about this, this would be like in the example on the top here of these giraffes. So he thought that early giraffes probably had short necks and they had to stretch their necks to be able to reach the food. Their offspring then had longer necks as they stretched to reach food. And eventually this continued stretching of the neck resulted in today's giraffes. So basically that the act of stretching the neck led to the next generation having longer necks and then the next generation having longer necks and so on and so forth. And that's not the case. It has to be something that is inherited. So if I go to the gym and I work out and I get a lot of muscle mass, does that mean that my offspring are going to have a greater muscle mass? Answer is no, right? It's myself, it's my own body that's already formed, not based on genetics. And so this theory didn't really pan out. And so Lamarck thought that animals passed along traits in accordance with the activities that they carry out which doesn't happen. So this would be like a duck swimming. Because it was swimming, it, have, it had webbed feet as a result of swimming. That doesn't happen. It was a random mutation that caused that trait to be present. Then we have Lyle, and he said, all changes in nature are gradual. And then in 1859, we come to Darwin and Wallace. And so when you think of Darwin, you think of him being like the father of evolution. But back then, that wasn't the, he wasn't the only one that was saying that things evolved. And so individuals in a population are different and that species arrive through the process of natural selection.
So Darwin's insights were inspired by the research he carried out during a five-year voyage he took around the world on a ship called the HMS Beagle beginning in 1831. And so Darwin was only 22 at the time of the voyage. He came from a very long line of physicians and his father was a physician. However, Darwin left medical school because he couldn't handle the sight of blood and the idea of surgery without anesthesia freaked him out. And so he decided to go on this different type of excursion. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at the path where Darwin took his journey. And so notice that he made quite a big trip out of this. But one of the things to note is that Darwin, a lot of his discoveries and his theories came from his experience while he was on the Galapagos Islands, which is off the coast of South America. And so Darwin noticed that the animals on the Galapagos Islands were similar to but also distinct from the animals on the South American mainland. So if he looked at these different types of iguanas, this one on the Galapagos Islands is different than the ones on the mainland in South America. So they do share some similarities, but they also have their own distinct differences. And that is due to different selective pressures, meaning differences in the environment and so because of these different selective pressures, they have unique traits that are not the same between them. And so he also studied his, what we refer to as Darwin's finches, these types of birds. And so he described 14 distinct types of finch, each different from the birds that are on the mainland, yet share some features. In particular, the beak shape of the finches varied depending on the food supply on the island. For example, if we look at the large ground finch, it has this very large beak that's used to crack seeds that fall to the ground. If we look at the small tree finch, notice that it has a very small beak that's used to grasp insects. If we look at the woodpecker finch, it has a long, narrow beak, which allows it to hold tools to probe for insects. And so depending on their different selective pressures, these birds have different beaks to help them get their food that they need. And so Darwin thought that these 14 finch species had probably descended from a single ancestral type of finch, Pondering the great variety of organisms in South America and their relationships to fossils and geology, he began to think that these were clues of how new species originate. And so he started to think that organisms changed over time. So in terms of Darwin's observations, his observations were made based on several different facts. So the first one is over overproduction and competition. And this is based on an essay on the principle of populations by Thomas Malthus. And this basically suggested that populations can increase faster than the food supply available, leading them to a struggle for existence. So if there are not enough resources available, organisms will struggle in terms of how well they can get the resources that they need. And so this is this overproduction and competition. It leads to competition and the organisms that are better adapted are going to survive better. He also noted the individual variations. So again, the variations in the beak sizes. And so he noticed that there were variations in terms of these beak sizes. And so this led to this theory of evolution by natural selection that occurs when heritable variations lead to differential reproductive success. And so what that means is that these traits, these variations must be heritable. And based on these traits, the better adapted the organism is for their environment, right? Because remember that there's a struggle for existence. So the better adapted the organism is in their environment, the more likely they are to survive and reproduce. 
and that leads to that differential reproductive success. And then those traits become more prevalent in future generations. And so key points for evolution by natural selection. Key point number one, natural selection acts on individuals, but evolution acts on populations. So individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve. Right, so natural selection, that pressure, like for example, in the antibiotic resistance example, the antibiotic um, drug put pressure on the bacteria and the ones that had that trait were more likely to survive. And so that would be natural selection. Evolution, remember, is a change in the frequency of alleles within a population. So again, an individual can't evolve but a population can evolve. Natural selection can amplify or diminish only heritable traits. Again, back to the example about weightlifting, if I build a lot of muscle, that is not going to affect my offspring because that is not a heritable trait. Evolution is not goal-directed, it has no aim, it has no goal, and complex is not necessarily better. And so again, evolution is changing depending on the environment. And so there isn't just one ideal trait that is gonna be beneficial in every case. It's a population by population and an environment context that basically is what's gonna be driving evolution. So much subsequent research has corroborated and expanded on Darwin's findings. And so, Since that period, um, 1865 is where Mendel began to discover the basic laws of inheritance, right? Those heritable traits, those traits can be passed down for um, from generation to generation. 1906, decay rates of radioactive isotopes reveal that the earth is billions of years old. So the earth has been around for a very long time. Morgan and uh, Sturdevant uh, map genes onto chromosomes. So they basically are able to figure out what these hereditary units are, these chromosomes, and that's how these traits are passed down. Once we get to 1930s to the 1940s, modern evolutionary synthesis unifies research on genetics and evolution. And so we start to see this blending of these two aspects of biology, the genetics coming together with um, the evolution theories. 1953, Watson and Crick discover the structure of DNA. Uh, 1960s, we have the theory of that the plates of the, the tectonic plates explains basically this continental drift that we had this giant supercontinent, Pangaea, And that as the plates shift, we got this continental drift, which leads to our current situation with our continents now. 1970s, Peter and Rosemary Grant began documenting evolution in Darwin's finches. So they studied Darwin's finches and showed evidence that evolution was actively occurring. 1977, Carl Woese reclassifies life into three domains. So this gave us our current classification scheme, and that is domain bacteria, domain archaea, domain eukarya. Remember bacteria and archaea, those are both prokaryotic. Eukarya is going to be eukaryotic. 1995, large-scale genome sequencing begins, reinforcing genetic similarities among species. So what we can see is that even between species, that there are a lot of overlapping sequences that are found in both organisms like humans all the way down to organisms like yeast, which are a single-celled fungi. We actually have genes in common with those very primitive organisms. And so looking at these genome sequences showed us how similar we actually are. And then the present We have ongoing research on gene function and gene regulation, and that reveals more about the origins of these new phenotypes. So now we're going to move on and talk about the evidence for evolution. What is the evidence that suggests that evolution occurs? Now, I know that some people, this can be a very hot hot button topic, 
because of maybe religious reasons, for example, um, that some people might not agree with the theory of evolution because it goes against the Christian belief that God created the heavens and earth in seven days. But what I want you to do is when you're hearing this, to keep an open mind. And even if your religious beliefs don't allow you to fully agree with this, it is still important to listen to the evidence that suggests that evolution does occur. And so keep an open mind when you're listening to this. So first, the first piece of evidence that suggests that evolution occurs it are step by studying fossils. Fossils are remains and traces of past life or any other direct evidence of a past life. And so fossils form in many ways and preserve evidence of many types of organisms. So the hard body parts of most are most often what are preserved and the majority of fossils are embedded in sedimentary rock. And so you can see these different types of fossils and these patterns of these organisms that are basically embedded in this sedimentary rock. And so these basically show us the types of organisms that were around during this period of time. Now, when we look at where a fossil is located, um, the simpler and less precise method of dating fossils is referred to as relative dating. And this assumes that the lower rock layers have older fossils and that the newer rock layers have uh, more recent fossils. So again, these older layers on the bottom have the older fossils. And then as these rock structures formed towards the top, these are going to be newer fossils or basically more recent. And so where these fossils are found within these rock formations gives you a relative idea of how old a particular fossil might be. Now, absolute dating uses chemistry to determine how long ago a fossil formed. And radiometric dating is a type of absolute dating that uses radioactive isotopes. And by determining the amount of carbon-14 in a fossil, scientists can estimate when the organism lived. Because remember that standard carbon is carbon-12. Carbon-14 is radioactive. And carbon-14 basically is unstable and it decays over time. So the way that this works is that remember that living organisms can't distinguish between isotopes. Carbon-14 is seen like carbon-12. Meaning that whenever, wherever the organism would normally incorporate carbon-12, will also incorporate carbon-14. And so if we look at the bone, for example, they're going to have a proportion that is carbon-14. Now, carbon-12 is going to be stable. Carbon-14 is not. It is going to decay over time. And so after the organism dies and no new carbon-14 or carbon-12 is added because they're not taking in carbon anymore, the carbon-14 is going to decay and it's gonna leave as nitrogen-14. So it's going to change and it's going to break down. And so by measuring the amount of carbon-14, it gives us an idea of how old those bones are, right? Because the longer those bones have been there, the less carbon-14 is going to be present because it's losing carbon-14 at a constant rate. And so what you're looking at is, is that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. And what that means is that after the death of an organism occurs, right, so that's this dotted line, after this death occurs, one half of carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14 every 5,730 years. So if the level of carbon-14 is, is half what it is before, then that tells you that that fossil is 5,730 years old. And so we can use this radiometric dating to determine the age of the fossils.
And so this gives us a better idea of how old those fossils actually are. So there is excellent agreement between the relative ages assigned to fossils by the evolutionary theory and the absolute ages assigned to them by radiometric dating. So shown here is a fossilized trilobite that existed from 500 million to 245 million years ago. So that's basically um, when that organism is believed to have been found. Now, you're not going to find this fossil next to human fossils because primates didn't begin until 65 million years ago. And so you don't see those fossils together, right? Remember we talked about relative dating. So if you look within a rock structure, the older the fossil would be on the bottom, the newer fossils would be on the top. And so because humans evolved much later than this trilobite, they're not going to be found in the same rock formations. And so that, that basically suggests that there is good agreement between relative dating and the absolute dating. So which rock layer should have fossils with the most carbon-14. So is it green down here towards the bottom, yellow, the next layer up, or red, this top layer here? So pause your video, think of your answer, and when you're ready, go ahead and push play to hear the answer. So if you said red, you are correct. The top layer, remember these top layers here, are going to be newer fossils. And so those newer fossils, right, they are more recent, and so they're gonna have the most carbon-14. If we go down here to the green, where these are older fossils, because those fossils have not been incorporating carbon-14, and these fossils, these organisms have been dead for longer, that carbon-14 is decaying over time, and the amount of carbon-14 in the fossils in the green area is going to be relatively low because they have lost most of their carbon-14 as it has decayed. So this is just putting it all together. So the top layers would be where we find the most carbon-14. The next piece of evidence comes from biogeography, which is the geographical distribution of species, and it considers the species geographical location. And the Earth's geography has changed drastically over the last 200 million years. If we look at about 280 to 200 million years ago, the continents were all joined into one supercontinent, which we call Pangaea. If we look at um, 181 to 135 million years ago, it starts to break into two continents. And then we start to get this break into the continents that we now know today. And so looking at the types of organisms that are found distributed on these different continents actually gives us some idea of evolution. So marsupial mammals like the kangaroo, for example, and the koala and the ringtail possum and the common wombat, these marsupial mammals evolved in Australia and they evolved independently of the placental mammals in other parts of the world. So humans, for example, would be a placental mammal. We use a placenta to feed our baby while they are in utero. There is evidence from Madagascar as well. Madagascar is off the coast of Africa, and it has no native members of the cat family. No dogs, no antelopes, no rabbits or monkeys or apes, but it houses nearly 100% of the world's 49 species of primates known as the lemurs. And so now what can explain this seemingly odd pattern of distribution? So few varieties of some animals on these islands, but so many varieties of others, right? Why does Madagascar have, is missing all of the other animals that are on Africa, but yet it has so many lemurs on it almost exclusively. And so we know from geology that Madagascar broke off from a giant supercontinent that included Africa, about 165 million years ago. Madagascar became isolated from the other land masses, explaining the lack of other animals that are seen in Africa. 
And this allowed the creatures on Madagascar to evolve because the lemurs did not have to deal with the competition from the primates that are found in abundance in Africa and the monkeys and the apes. Next, we have comparative morphology and embryology. And so common descent offers an explanation for anatomical similarities among organisms. So the reason that they have these structures that are similar is, again, because it's believed that they formed from a common ancestor. And so homologous structures are structures that have the same function and basic structure, indicating a common ancestor. And so an example of this would be a human arm and a whale forelimb. So if you look at the bone structures of a variety of animals, so here we have humans, horses, cats, whales, bats, and birds. And so notice that they have a very similar bone structure. They have a larger humerus, the upper part of your arm. They have this two bone system in the lower part, the ulna and the radius. They have the metacarpals, which for you would be your wrist. And then your phalanges would be your fingers. And notice that you see something very similar throughout a variety of animals. And so these would be basically these homologous structures. And they have a um, similar structure and function. Anatomical similarities are often most obvious in the embryo. Notice how much more similar human and chimpanzee skulls are in the fetus compared to adults. So here's a human a human fetus and a chimpanzee fetus. And if you remember, I talked about that humans and chimpanzees share about 99% of their DNA sequences. So we actually have a lot of DNA in common with the chimpanzee. If you look at early development, again, you can see that the, sh- the bone structure of the early embryo is much more similar than the bone structure of the adult. The adult chimpanzee and the adult human the bone structure becomes more dramatically different uh, uh, over time. Adult fish, mice, and alligators have very different bodies. However, their evolutionary relationships are more obvious in their embryos. So if you look at the embryos of the fish, the mouse, and the alligator, you'll notice that early on, they actually have a lot more in common with one another. And if you've ever seen an early human embryo, we actually look kind of similar to the mouse, we still have a tail. That tail ends up being your sacral bone or your tailbone. Um, But notice in early development that these organisms tend to look very similar. And so that indicates that there is this evolutionary relationship between these animals because they do look similar at certain points in their life cycle. The next piece of evidence for evolution comes from molecular biology. And the hereditary background of an organism is documented in its DNA, right? The DNA sequences that they have, the proteins encoded by the DNA, because remember that the DNA is gonna code for the protein. And so the evolutionary relationships among species can be determined by comparing the genes, so those DNA sequences, and the proteins of different organisms. The more in common two organisms have, the more closely related they are. So if we compare, so this is basically comparing um, chimpanzees and humans. And so obviously chimpanzees 100% match with the chimpanzee. If we look at humans, it's around 98 to 99%. So we have a lot in common with the chimpanzee. Notice that humans have more in common in terms of DNA sequence with the chimpanzee than the chimpanzee does to the other primates. So it has more in common with humans than it does with the gorilla or the orangutan or this old world monkey, etc. And so we can look at DNA sequences to kind of give us an idea of how closely related different organisms are. The more sequences in common they have, the tighter their evolutionary history is linked, meaning they diverged much more recently in our evolutionary history. So variations found in the DNA sequences of various organisms are consistent with the evolutionary theory. 
And there are some genes that do very similar things in different organisms. For example, a gene called hedgehog helps regulate embryonic development in the Drosophila fruit fly. And a gene called sonic hedgehog, yes, like the video game, that helps regulate embryonic development in mice. And so they have these very similar genes, these very similar DNA sequences that do very similar things in different organisms. So both of these proteins basically help regulate embryonic development. And so even though the fruit fly and the mouse is going to be very distinct in as, as their adult form, they do have proteins in common that basically help do very similar things. Although the genes are similar, they are not identical. And gene-based sequences change over time through the process of mutation. And this occurs at a constant rate of time. And so what we can do is then we can look at those DNA sequences. The more mutations they have, meaning the more variations they have between one another, the farther back that those organisms diverged and became separate species. And so we can look at the DNA sequences to give us evolutionary timelines, essentially. So this is looking at a particular um, gene for cytochrome C oxidase, which is involved in the electron transport chain, and comparing how similar those sequences are between different types of organisms. So if we look at the choices here, we have humans, pig, duck, snake, tuna, moth, and yeast. And so notice that the human and the pig have 13 nucleotides different between them. So if I look at this evolutionary tree, notice that the branch point is much closer. That means that because they have very little number of nucleotides different, these organisms diverged more recently. They are more closely related. On the other hand, if we compare humans with yeast, there are 66 nucleotides difference. And so notice that when we look at this evolutionary tree, those diverged a long time ago. And that's why they have such a greater amount of nucleotides different between those two sequences. And so the more nucleotide bases differences between the species, the more distant the common ancestor, meaning they diverged as separate species much longer ago. And so this gives us this evolutionary relationship between different types of organisms. And then we also have plenty of experimental evidence that supports the theory of evolution. There are loads of it in both uh, nature and in the lab. And so you'll see examples of this in the later part of this lecture as well. An example of experimental evidence would be in an experiment that was done with male guppies. And the larger, more colorful male guppies were chosen more often by females for mating. This is something known as sexual selection. So the more beautiful and brightly colored the males are, the more likely that the females will want to mate with them. On the other hand though, being bold and bright colored makes those guppies more vulnerable to predators. And so if the guppies are placed in a predator-free environment, the guppies evolve to have brighter coloration and larger tails, meaning that if we look at the frequency within the population, the frequency of those bright, bold guppies will increase over time because there's no predators to select against that trait. And that it, in that particular environment, that trait is beneficial and it's selected for. However, if predators were reintroduced into the population, the males then evolved to have smaller tails and less brilliant colors because now the environment changes and so now we have a different adaptation that's advantageous. It's not the ones that are bright and bold because the ones that are bright and bold are more likely to be eaten by the predators. And so now the advantage goes to the guppies that have the smaller tails and the less brilliant color. And so this again, this shows a couple things. It shows one, that evolution does occur, that we do get this frequency in the 
the frequencies of the alleles in a population that changes over time. But it also shows you that evolutionary fitness, so how well an organism is adapted to their environment, can change as well. Again, there is no one perfect organism. It's all in the context of their environment. And if the environment changes, what was once beneficial could now be a disadvantage. And so we're going to move on to talk about what is it that evolves. So the smallest unit that evolves is the population. And again, a population is defined as all of the members of a single species living in a defined geographical area at a given time. So how then do we get evolution occurring? Well, if we look at this example here, where we have these frogs, and these frogs are in this original environment. And let's say that the environment becomes altered and we get this expanse of barren terrain in between. So now we have geographically isolated these two populations. And so we have population A that's over here and we have population B that's over here. And so we get this geographical separation. When the separation occurs, there is only a single species of frog, but now that species is divided into two distinct groups that are separated, and therefore they are not interbreeding. They're not breeding with one another. Each population now faces the natural selection pressures of its own environment. So if population A, for example, has more of the lighter color trees and population B has more of the darker population trees, well, then the frogs are going to evolve independently and the frogs in population A are gonna to evolve to be lighter in color and the frogs in population B are going to evolve to be darker in color because they're each facing their own selective pressures. Now, genes exist in variant forms that are called alleles. And in most species, no individual will possess more than two alleles for a given gene. Because remember that organisms are typically diploid. There are exceptions to this. But for humans, for example, we are diploid. We have one allele from mom and one allele from dad. So while an individual can only carry two alleles, right? You can only have the allele from mom and the allele from dad. A population, however, is likely to possess many alleles for a given gene. We saw an example of this when we looked at blood types, when we looked in genetics, right? There are three alleles, but a particular person can only have two of them. And so for any given gene, it's possible to have more than two alleles. A single person will only contain two of those alleles. And so the sum total of alleles in a population is referred to as that population's gene pool. So its gene pool is the sum of the alleles in that population. The basis of evolution is a change in the frequency of alleles in a gene pool. So that is the whole idea behind the idea of evolution. Remember I said it comes down to the frequency of the alleles in the population over time. So this is just showing you the genetic basis for evolution. So we have these darker color frogs and they have allele A1 and A2. And this results in frogs that are darker in color. If we look at these lighter color frogs, they have allele A2 and then instead of A1, they have this A4. And so it's this combination of these alleles that's going to dictate what color the frogs are going to be. And so when they're in separate populations and they are experiencing different selective pressures, you will start to see a shift in the frequency of alleles within that population. To the extent that a given set of alleles increases in frequency from one generation to the next within the population, the phenotypes produced by these alleles will be exhibited to a greater extent within the population, right? Because if the organism is more likely to survive, if they're more likely to survive and then they reproduce, that is going to keep those alleles in the population. And when those alleles are in the population, you're gonna have that particular phenotype. 
And so with such a change, a population can be said to have evolved. And evolution at this level is referred to as microevolution, which is a change of allele frequencies within a population over a relatively short period of time. You're going to see that later in this lecture, we will talk about macroevolution, looking at a greater span of time and how new species form. But we're looking at just shifts in the allele frequency over a short period of time when we discuss microevolution. So again, macroevolution is a product of microevolution, but it's evolution on a larger scale. And so this is a type of evolution that results in the formation of new species or other large groupings of living things. So question for you, the set of all alleles in the population is the, is it red gene pool, yellow allele variant, green allele frequency, blue genotype, purple gene flow? So pause your video, think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play. So if you said it is the gene pool, that is correct. The gene pool is the set of all the alleles in the population. And so that would be the gene pool. So now we're gonna move on and we are going to talk about five agents of microevolution, meaning five driving forces that drive microevolution, that drive a change in the frequency of alleles within a particular population. So there are five forces that can bring about a change in allele frequencies in a population. And these five agents of microevolution include mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, sexual selection, and natural selection. And so we're gonna walk through and talk about each one. Variation is found in human populations and in other populations such as this population of island beetles. Color in these beetles is determined by different versions of a gene, different alleles. Green is the dominant trait, so green beetles have two green alleles, or a green allele and a brown allele. Brown beetles have two brown alleles. By counting the brown alleles and green alleles, we can calculate that this population has 30% brown alleles and 70% green alleles. The frequency of brown alleles is greater than the frequency of brown beetles because some green beetles have a brown allele. Allele frequencies change as populations evolve. What causes populations to evolve? The island is suffering from a drought. And in this dry environment, brown beetles are better camouflaged than green beetles. Birds are more likely to see and eat green beetles. Over time, brown beetles survive and reproduce more than green beetles. This is an example of natural selection. Individuals with inherited traits better suited to their environment survive and produce more offspring than other individuals. Here, natural selection causes the frequency of the brown allele to increase. Through natural selection, the population has become better adapted to its new environment. Genetic drift occurs when populations evolve due to chance events. Let's see how genetic drift affects this small population of beetles. Chance constantly affects which beetles actually reproduce and which of their alleles they pass on. In a small population, chance events produce large fluctuations in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. Here, the frequency of the brown allele has decreased to zero, and the population is left with only green beetles. Genetic drift also occurs in large populations. But in a large population, Genetic drift has a less effect because it causes much smaller fluctuations in allele frequencies. Other random events can also lead to genetic drift. By chance, this volcano kills more brown beetles than green beetles, causing the frequency of the green allele to increase. <laughs> 
Gene flow describes evolution due to individuals moving into or out of a population. When green and brown beetles migrate into the all-green population, the frequency of the brown allele increases. Natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow are the major mechanisms responsible for the evolution of all populations. Together, they shape populations of beetles as well as humans. So now we're going to look at the five modes of microevolution. And the first is going to be the mutation. And remember that a mutation is any permanent alteration in an organism's DNA. And some of these mutations are heritable, meaning that they can be passed from one generation to the next. Now, the heritable mutations are the ones that are going to be playing a role in evolution because you need to be able to pass that trait on to the next generation. So if I go in the sun and I get a mutation in my skin, is that going to affect my offspring? Are they going to have that mutation? And the answer is no, because my skin cells are not the cells that are going to give rise to my offspring. Mutations in this case have to happen in the gametes, in the reproductive cells. So in males, that would be the sperm, and in females, that would be um, the egg. And so when a mutation can occur, there are several types of mutations that we can have happen. We can have a point mutation or a base pair substitution where we swap one base pair, AT, with another one, CG. That will then lead to, depending on where it's located, that can lead to a change in the protein sequence, like we saw, for example, for sickle cell anemia. We can also have these large-scale deletions where an entirely, like a whole portion of the chromosome gets deleted. If those mutations, again, happen in the gametes, that is going to then be a heritable mutation, and it can be passed from one generation to the next. Now, mutations happen fairly infrequently, and most mutations either have no effect or are harmful. Yet, rare adaptive mutations are vital to evolution in that they are the only means by which entirely new genetic information comes into being. This is how we get these new DNA sequences. So what you're looking at down here is this is Staphylococcus aureus. This is a type of bacteria that is found on the skin. And so you can see here it is on the skin. Here's hair. And here are these bacterial cells. Now, Staph aureus for many people, many people can be carriers of Staph aureus. About a third of the population carry Staph aureus as part of their normal flora, meaning it's a bacteria that's normally found on their skin and it doesn't really cause any infections. However, if that Staph aureus acquires a mutation and that mutation makes them resistant to an antibiotic. Now, if an antibiotic is present, just like we saw in our natural selection slide, if an antibiotic is present, that is going to select for bacteria that are antibiotic resistant because the ones that are not resistant are gonna die off and the ones that are resistant are gonna survive and they're going to reproduce. And so now you end up with a new population that is antibiotic resistant. And so notice that this was microevolution. This mutation then caused a change in the allele frequency. And so an example of that that we've talked about would be MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. That is a strain of Staph aureus that is resistant to a group of antibiotics related to methicillin. And so it can cause dramatic skin infections, it can cause necrotizing fasciitis, which is flesh eating disease, it could form, it could cause sepsis, so bloodborne infection, toxic shock syndrome, food poisoning, etc. And so Staph aureus can cause a variety of different types of diseases. The next form of microevolution is going to be gene flow. This is the movement of genes from one population to another and it takes place through migration, meaning the movement of individuals from one population into the territory of another. And so if we look at these tarweeds, 
And we have gene flow where the uh, seeds have dispersed and end up on the Hawaiian Islands. And now you end up with this Hawaiian silver sword. So this is gene flu flow. We have the movement of genes from one place to another. Now, this was an interesting article. It was a Time article in 1993, and it shows what they assume people will look like over time, because if you think about it, more than ever, people are migrating and moving from one place to another, and we're starting to get a lot more blending of different ethnicities, and this is what this drawing came out to be, what America would look like over time, with the different blending of cultures. Now, whether or not we actually see this, who knows, but it's just interesting to see that's kind of what they perceived um, Americans would look like over time. Next, we have genetic drift. Genetic drift causes allele frequencies to change randomly. So this is a random event that causes the allele frequency to change. Now, genetic drift can have a large effect on small populations through two common scenarios. One is referred to as a population bottleneck, and that is a sudden reduction in the number of alleles present in a population. So maybe, you know, a lot of them die off from some natural event. We can have the founder effect, and that is a change in allele frequencies that occurs when a new population is established. So when a subpopulation migrates. So a group of individuals then go and colonize a new area. That's gonna cause the founder effect because if a small group migrates to, let's say an island and starts to populate it, they only took a small percentage of that gene pool with them. And so let's take a look at these in more detail. So looking at genetic drift, this slide is just illustrating the effect on a small population is much greater than the effect on a large population. So let's say we're comparing a population that has 10,000 penguins compared to a small population of only 10. And so in both cases, we start out with 10% of the population carrying that allele. So 10% would mean out of 10,000 penguins, there would be 1,000 of them that would have that allele. In a population of only 10, 10% means that only one of them has this allele. So let's say that there's some dramatic event that happens, um, some kind of catastrophe, and 50% of the population is wiped out. So of the 10,000, what that means is 5,000 are left, and simply by chance, let's say 450 of them have the allele. So notice that 450 out of 5,000, the allele frequency changed. It went down to 9%, but this effect is relatively small. The allele frequency didn't shift too much. However, in a small population, if 50% of the population is wiped out, it's a lot easier by chance to lose that allele. So if five penguins remain, and by chance that one penguin that was a carrier is wiped out, now you have zero out of five having that particular allele, and we now end up with a percent allele frequency of 0%. So notice that in a small population, the change is much more dramatic. It went from 10% in the population down to zero. So again, genetic drift has a much larger effect on small populations. So again, the first of these is going to be the bottleneck effect. And again, this is defined as a change in the allele frequency due to chance during a sharp reduction in population size. An example of this was that the northern elephant seal was hunted to near extinction in the 1700s and the 1800s. So we had a lot of diversity initially, but because of hunting, many of them died off and only a very small population remained. A remnant population of fewer than 100 seals was discovered and protected. And then because only a small percentage were left behind, those then reproduced, 
and gave rise to the new population, which has a very different allele frequency now than it did before that event. Because when you have a small population left, you are going to have basically a lot of diversity wiped out. And so the current population of 175,000 descended from those few seals and has virtually no genetic diversity because a lot of that genetic diversity was wiped out during that phase where they were really being hunted often. So the second type of genetic drift, again, is going to be the founder effect. And this is where a small subpopulation migrates to a new area, starting a new population, and it's likely to bring with it only a portion of the original population's gene pool because it's not like the entire country is moving. It might be a group of individuals. And so only a small percentage of um, the new population is going to have that allele. This is another kind of sampling of the gene pool, but in this case, it's caused by the migration of a few individuals rather than the survival of only a few. So this would be like if our class, Bio 100, started a new colony on the moon. Our class is only gonna have a very small subset of the gene pool. It does not have all of the different possibilities that we would see, for example, in the United States. And so we would end up with this founder effect. An example of this is a rare genetic disease called cornea plana which results in misshapen cornea and leads to the impaired close range vision and general clouding of the eyesight. This disease only affects 113 people worldwide, so it's extremely rare, but 78% of them are in an area of Northern Finland. And current research indicates that about 400 years ago, a small population arrived in this isolated area with at least one member of the population carrying the recessive allele that causes this affliction. And so because a very small subset of people moved to this region and within that very small population, somebody was a carrier, that then created this founder effect. Right, and so this is just showing you an example of this, right? Here's your original population, which has a lot of genetic diversity, but if only a small subset then migrates to a new area and they colonize and they start to reproduce, notice that the new population has a much, much different allele frequency than the original population. It has a lot less diversity because it doesn't represent the entire population. Um, another example of this would be something called Ellis Van Crevald syndrome in the Amish populations. You can see they have these kind of abnormal hand structures as a result. And again, it's because a small group started this Amish population and it kept this trait within that population. So sexual selection is a form of natural selection that has an effect on the frequency of alleles in the population. And this occurs when there are differences in reproductive success arise because of differential success in mating. For example, if you think about a peacock, the more brightly colored, the more attractive those males are to a female. And if those males, those brightly colored peacocks are more attractive, they're more likely to attract a mate and therefore more likely to pass on those traits um, with a greater frequency in the next generation. And so we also looked at this when we talked about the evidence for evolution, and we talked about the example with the guppies, right? So in a predator-free environment, the guppies, the male guppies that were brightly colored, they were more likely to attract a mate and therefore would pass that trait on with greater frequency. And there are lots of different forms of sexual selection, whether it's physical characteristics of an organism, whether it's a mating ritual, anything that can attract a mate more so than another trait, that's gonna pass on, those traits are gonna be able to be passed on to the future generations. And then the last one for, for microevolution is looking at natural selection. And so we basically talked about that natural selection simply is the more likely an organism is to survive and reproduce, 
the more likely those traits are going to show up in future generations. And so that's then going to lead to evolution, which is a change in the frequency of the alleles. Now, in order for natural selection to occur, organisms have adaptations. Okay, and an adaptation is a modification in the form, physical structure, or behavior of an organism in a population over generations in response to environmental change. For example, camouflage is an example of an adaptation. Organisms that have camouflage are able to hide from their predators and therefore that makes them better suited for their environment. And so natural selection is the only agent of microevolution that consistently acts to adapt organisms to their environment. Now again, remember natural selection doesn't cause these alleles to appear in a population. They're simply selecting those alleles that are better suited for that environment. And so this is gener generally regarded as the most powerful force underlying evolution. And so I just put this slide on here and this just basically summarizes those five forces that bring about changes in allele frequencies. And so you can go back and just review and make sure that you understand these different types of microevolution. So throughout the lectures that are recorded, whenever you see a question that has a color answer, um, go ahead and pause. Okay, and think about the question before you play the video again. Okay, so for example, this question says, which agent of change in allele frequencies in populations strongly affects small populations? Is it red, segregation, yellow, meiosis, green, mutation, blue, genetic drift, or purple, natural selection? So go ahead, pause, and when you're ready, push play again to hear the answer. Okay, so if you said blue genetic drift, you are correct. Remember that we talked about that genetic drift is the chance um, reduction in a population and that then is gonna have a greater effect on a small population, right? If you flip a coin only three times or four times, let's say, you would expect half the times you're gonna get heads, half the time you're gonna get tails. But what you often know is that that doesn't occur when you're looking at a small sample size. Same thing in terms of genetic drift, okay? The larger the population, the less you're gonna see a change in allele frequency. A smaller population, if you reduce that number, let's say in half, that's gonna have a much greater effect on a small group versus a very large group. So the answer is genetic drift. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about natural selection. So Rosemary and Peter Grant are famous biologists who worked on Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Islands for over 20 years. And what they did was they basically went to the Galapagos Islands and they studied the finches that were there. And so what they did was, let's say we're looking um, in 1976. And so if you look here in 1976, right along that middle there, Okay, so here, notice that the average beak depth was about nine and a half millimeters. Now, in 1978, there was a drought that happened. And so because of the um, loss of water in the area, the seeds became harder and tougher. And so the birds started to see a shift. And notice you'll see that in 1978, the average beak length was over 10 millimeters. And that's different than in the wet years in 1976, where you see that the beak uh, depth was much smaller. And so in wet years, the small seeds were more abundant and actually the small beaks were favored. But in dry years where the seeds were hard, long beaks are favored because the large seeds are the ones that remain behind. And the birds had to have that large strong beak in order to eat that food. Now, you often hear, when you hear of Darwin, you hear of survival of the fittest. And survival of the fittest can be uh, quite misleading because that basically implies that evolution works to produce generally superior beings who would be successful in any environment. But we all know, we've talked about examples, that that's not always true. An organism has an adaptation that might make them well adapted to one environment, 
But if that environment changes, they may not be well adapted anymore. And so survival of the fittest is kind of misleading. Um, and, and again, it's not only survival, the organism also has to be able to reproduce in order to pass those traits on to future generation. So when we talk about um, an organism's fitness, when we, when we refer to evolutionary fitness, this has to do with the relative reproductive success of individuals in a given environment at a given time. And one individual is said to be more fit than another to the extent that it has more offspring than another. And individuals are not born with invariable levels of fitness. Instead, that fitness can change in accordance with the changes in the surrounding environments. And so again, fitness can change. We talked about an, an example of um, the green mantids, right? The ones in Costa Rica, that as long as those trees are available, and the mantids are able to blend in with the environment, then those are well adapted. But if a developer came in and it took down all those trees, well, now that mantid is not so well adapted. And so that's evolutionary fitness. So in this example here, you see some cats, and the cats have their kittens. So if you look here on the left, this cat only has one offspring, and the cat on the right has a lot more offspring. So if you look at these examples, the cat on the right would have greater evolutionary fitness because it's more likely to pass that trait on to its future generations. However, if let's say that this cat that has all of these kittens, if that cat's not able to take care of those kittens and all of those kittens, let's say, die, then now fitness would shift towards this cat over here who had the one cat but was able to take care of it and that cat survived, that kitten survived and passed those traits on. And so fitness is changing and this is why we say it's relative fitness and evolutionary fitness. This is not a fixed discrete thing. Um, depending on the environment, a cat or an organism, their evolutionary fitness could change. And so the last part of this lecture, we're gonna look at the three modes of natural selection. And so the three types of natural selection are stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. And in stabilizing selection, this is a type of selection that reduces both of the extremes in the population, but actually favors the average. And there's no change in the average value over time, and the genetic variation is reduced. So basically you're favoring the average and getting rid of the two extremes. When you see directional selection, you can imagine what that means. Directional means it's shifting the phenotype in one direction. And so you're gonna favor now one extreme, not the average and not the other extreme. And then disruptive natural selection is basically going to favor the extremes and select against the phenotypes in the middle. And so in this type of selection, we're gonna eliminate the phenotypes near the average. And so let's look at some examples of each of these types. So if you think about stabilizing selection, an example of this would be infant birth size. Um, infants have a uh, range of birth weights that would indicate the most likely to survive. So notice like the average infant birth would be between about six and a half and seven pounds. Now, if birth weight is too low, so if you look over here, if birth weight is low, you'll notice that here's the births and here's the deaths. So if you notice, if you look at the red line, the lower the birth weight, the higher the mortality rate, so notice the death rate is really high, and the lower the chance of survival. So infants that are too small aren't likely to survive, as well as infants that are too large. And you might think, well, why would an infant that's too large not be able to survive? Well, it could have problems during delivery. It might have an underlying condition, which gives it respiratory problems. Um, there are a lot of reasons why a baby that's actually too large would also have a higher mortality rate. And so if you notice, this is gonna favor the average, right? This type of selection, it's most likely that the infants will be born in this middle birth weight. Now again, directional selection is gonna favor one of the extremes. And so let's say you looked at one point and you looked at the coloring of moths and you would see maybe some that are light, some that are dark, and some that are in between. And now think about when the Industrial Revolution happened. 
when all those large factories were being built and all that soot started to cover the trees, that caused those trees to change and the bark started to darken. And now the moss that were darker in color had camouflage. They were able to blend in with their environment. The moths that were light in color, they no longer would blend in with the environment and they actually stood out and were more likely to become prey and therefore the light moths started to die off. And so you'll notice you start to see a shift in your population. Most of the moths now favor one extreme. They favor the dark color and not the average and not the light color. And so that's directional selection. We're favoring one of the extremes. In disruptive selection, you're again favoring the two extremes, but not favoring the middle. And so if you look at the finches, for example, oftentimes you'll see either large beaks or small beaks, but not intermediate beaks. And that's because the large beaks are adapted to specialize in cracking a very hard seed and the small beaks are adapted to feed on several soft varieties. And so they each now have their own niche. They have their own food source and they're not competing for a common resource. And so this type of selection is favoring the two extremes. The birds either typically have the large beaks or they have the small beaks, but not in between. And so again, this slide is just kind of showing you the three types of selection. So directional selection, you're favoring one extreme. So here's your original population, and the population that evolved is now favoring one of the two sides. In disruptive, in disruptive you're favoring the two extremes, but not the average. And so notice that your original population had a lot of the average size, but in the new population, they're either, let's say, light colored or they're dark colored, but they're not in between. And then stabilizing selection, this is again where you favor the average. So notice your original population has this bell curve and in stabling select, stabilizing selection, you're favoring the average. Notice that this basically eliminated the two extremes and we've enhanced the average. So question for you, as humans migrated out of Africa and towards Northern Europe, reduced exposure to ultraviolet radiation selected for lighter skin color. What type of natural selection does this example illustrate? Is it red, stabilizing selection, yellow, disruptive, or green, directional selection? So again, pause, think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play again. So if you said directional selection, you are correct. So as we started to get kind of an intermediate um, skin color and we've gone towards the extreme, which would be the lighter skin color, that's going to be a directional selection. You're not favoring the average, you're favoring one of the two extremes. And so that's going to be your directional selection. So now we're going to look at what is a species. Now remember when we talked about microevolution and macro? Microevolution is on a small time scale whereas macroevolution encompasses major biological changes over a long period of time. And in macroevolution, you'll start to see the formation of new species. Now, speciation is the term for the formation of a new species. And this is the focal point of macroevolution. And we're gonna talk about in a minute the two different ways, the two paces that speciation typically takes on. But we need to start first by talking about what is a species. If you remember back to our lecture in lab on diversity of life, we wrote down a definition of a species. And the biological species concept defines a species as a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed with one another and to produce fertile offspring. Okay, so if two organisms reproduce and produce fertile offspring, that would be of the same species. If they are reproductively isolated, meaning they can't reproduce with one another, then they are two separate species. Okay, and so we'll talk about how does speciation occur. Now, when we look at the biological species concept, it's important to note that this is based on reproductive compatibility 
rather than physical similarity. If you look here at these two birds, you'll notice that they look very similar. But in fact, those two birds are two different species. If you look at humans, on the other hand, humans are all of one species, right? We're all homo sapiens, yet we see so much genetic diversity within our population. And so that's a really big, important fact to think about is you can't just look at an organism to say whether or not they are of the same species. Two organisms can look very similar, like the example here on the left, but in fact not be able to breed and therefore would not be of the same species. And so we'll spend some time talking about what are these reproductive barriers that can occur that, uh, that make it so two organisms cannot interbreed. So because biological species are defined in terms of their reproductive compatibility, the formation of a new species depends on reproductive isolation, meaning that they are reproductively isolated and they can't breed with one another. And so a reproductive barrier is anything that prevents individuals of closely related species from interbreeding. And we're gonna look at some of these reproductive barriers. What are these reasons that prevent two closely related organisms from breeding together? And so we're gonna look at how do new species arise. So when we talk about patterns of evolution, there are two main types. Uh, one is referred to as non-branching evolution, meaning that a particular species just changes. So if you look here, here's our original population, and they have evolved some new traits. So example, notice the coloring is a little bit different. And if that new coloring makes that organism uh, more likely to survive and reproduce and pass it on with a greater frequency, then that species has now evolved, but they haven't formed a new species. On the other hand, when we look at branching evolution, this is where some of the members of that population acquire um, a new allele. And once they do that, if that prevents those two organisms from breeding, now we have a new species formed, right? We still have the original bird, but we now also have this other new species um, that cannot breed with the original. And so that is speciation. They can no longer breed. So we're gonna talk about some reproductive isolations and some barriers for reproduction. And the reproductive barriers can be broken up into two main categories. Uh, the first are the pre-zygotic barriers. And pre is before, and zygotic means the zygote. So if you remember back to when we talked about a zygote, that's that early embryo, that fertilized egg. And so these type of barriers actually exist before the zygote is ever formed. So for one reason or another, it may prevent members from different species from even attempting to mate. It could also prevent an attempted mating from being completed successfully. Or it may hinder fertilization if mating is completed successfully. So maybe they can reproduce or mate, but you can't actually um, form offspring. And so these would be some examples of prezygotic barriers. And we'll talk about specific types for each one of these. Post-zygotic, right, post is after. Zygote is the zygote. So these are ones that exist after the zygote's formed. So in this type of isolation, the zygote's able to form, but for one reason or not, um, once the zygote forms, it can't um, continue to be uh, to populate a new species, okay? And so this contributes to reproductive isolation after the zygotes form. And we're gonna talk about the three types. So reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and reduced hybrid breakdown, okay? And so we're gonna start by focusing on the pre-zygotic barriers first. And again, this is before the zygote happens. So this is where you actually can um, ha have prezygotic barriers that isolate two organisms reproductively through one of three ways. Um, temporal iso isolation is time. 
So maybe they mate at different times of the year. Maybe one is a nocturnal organism and one is out during the day. So temporal refers to time. Habitat isolation, if you talk about an organism's habitat, it's like where does it live? So if two organisms have different habitats, if one lives on land and one lives in water, they're gonna be physically isolated from one another and therefore they're not gonna be able to breed. And then we also have behavioral isolation. And so this is where the behavior of the organisms are not compatible. Uh, maybe it's a bird that sings a slightly different song that can't be used in a mating ritual. Okay, and so that's behavioral isolation. When looking at after a mating attempt, so meaning two organisms can attempt to mate, there are other reasons that a zygote might not form. Uh, one would be mechanical isolation. So maybe they can't physically get their genitalias to line up. Um, also, we might have gametic isolation, meaning that the gametes can't form. Um, the two gametes actually can't come together through fertilization. And so let's look at some specific examples. So let's look at the different types of prezygotic barriers. And the first prezygotic barrier is gonna be our habitat isolation. And again, the habitat is the envir environment in which an organism lives. And so when we talk about habitat isolation, it means that they live in two different environments. Um, Again, maybe one lives in water and one lives on land. Those would be unique habitats that don't overlap. In this example here, these ladybugs feed on different plants. And because they feed on different plants and they live in these different environments, they are reproductively isolated and they're not gonna be able to breed and they're not gonna produce fertile offspring. If we look at temporal isolation, this, remember, temporal refers to time. And so these are reproductively isolated based on time. Now, it could be the times in which they're active. Maybe one is a nocturnal organism and one is active during the day. If that's true, they're not going to be able to reproduce with one another because they're not active at the same times. Um, another way that there could be temporal isolation is that maybe they're fertile at different times. Maybe one is fertile, let's say, in the spring, and another species is fertile during the fall. And if they're fertile during different times of the year and that those fertilities don't overlap, then those two organisms are going to be reproductively isolated and they're not going to be able to mate with one another. In terms of behavioral isolation, again, behavioral meaning like behavior, and an example of this would be possibly different courtship activities. Uh, frogs, each species of frogs, might have their own unique mating call. And the mating call from one species might not attract the female from another species. And so this is a behavioral isolation. Their behavior is actually isolating them from reproducing with one another. Then we have our mechanical isolation. And this is where the mating uh, organs might be incompatible. So if you look down here and you look at these two species of snails, when they try to reproduce, they may try to reproduce, but their mating organs might not line up properly. And because their mating organs can't line up, they're not able to successfully reproduce. And so this would be a reproductive barrier. Similarly, you might also have incompatible pollinators. So if you look at sage species, sage species use different pollinators. And because of this, they're gonna be reproductively isolated because the different pollinator is, gonna, is not gonna land on the other type of plant. And then lastly, we have our gametic isolation. And this is where the gametes cannot unite, meaning fertilization cannot occur. And you can imagine that in animals that reproduce, let's say, in water, um, think of animals that release egg and sperm into the water. There are many different species that release egg and sperm into the water. And you wouldn't want, let's say, sea stars being fertilized by sea urchin sperm, right? And so because of this, and you want that species specificity, 
that is going to basically prohibit different species from being able to reproduce. Um, if you compare, let's say, a red sea urchin versus a purple one, uh, their egg and sperm are not compatible and therefore they can't have fertilization occur. Another big reason that you can sometimes have gametic isolation might be due to differences in chromosome number. So if you think about it, we've talked about, you know, for humans, human eggs have 46, or human eggs have 23 chromosomes, the sperm have 23 chromosomes. When fertilization occurs, we restore the diploid number. However, if there are abnormalities in chromosomes, let's say between two different species, uh, because of this, when fertilization goes to occur, it's not going to occur properly because uh, they have different chromosome numbers. Uh, but mostly when we're talking about gametic isolation, there actually is a signal on the sperm that allows it to recognize a specific species of eggs. Now, for our post-zygotic barriers, remember these are the ones after the zygote forms. So in this case, fertilization can occur and the zygote forms, but there's a problem after that fertilization. And so this could include reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and hybrid breakdown. And these three types of barriers prevent having viable fertile offspring. And remember that a species is defined as the ability to reproduce and produce fertile offspring. And so these prevent uh, forming viable fertile offspring. So examples of post-zygotic uh, reproductive isolation. The first is hybrid inviability. And so in hybrid inviability, the hybrid offspring fail to reach maturity. For example, Hybrid eucalyptus seeds and seedlings are not viable. They're not able to mature and turn into a new organism. And so that's hybrid inviability. The hybrids are not uh, viable. We also get hybrid infertility. And this is where the hybrid offspring are unable to reproduce. So again, we've talked about you know a horse and a donkey they can reproduce together and they can form a mule, but a mule is not a species because it's, because it's infertile. There are many hybrids that demonstrate hybrid infertility. There are such a thing as ligers, okay? So if you cross a lion and a tiger, you get a liger, but these ligers are infertile. And so a liger is not a species. It's a hybrid, but it can't go on to produce uh, fertile offspring. And so that's why we would say a lion is one species and a tiger is another. The next one is hybrid breakdown. And this is where the second generation hybrids have reduced fitness. So meaning that the hybrids are able to reproduce, but their offspring are not viable. Um, offspring of hybrid mosquitoes, for example, have abnormal genitalia and they can't reproduce properly. And so these are all examples of post-zygotic barriers. So question for you, a species of grasshopper will only mate with male A after hearing a highly specific song pattern. She will not mate with male B because he doesn't make this song. Has speciation occurred between males A and B? And if yes, which reproductive barrier is, is operating. Red, no, speciation has not occurred. Yellow, yes, behavioral isolation. Green, yes, mechanical isolation. Blue, yes, gametic isolation. So pause, think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play again. So if you said yellow, you are correct. Yes, speciation has occurred because male A and male B can't, um, the, those types of organisms can't reproduce with one another. So yes, speciation has occurred because they're reproductively isolated and it's behavioral isolation because of the song pattern. So they use a slightly different uh, mating ritual, which is a type of a behavior.
And so yes, it's a behavioral isolation. So here's another one. Two squirrel populations are separated on two sides of a canyon for 10,000 years as a result of migration. Upon reuniting, they mate and produce fertile offspring. Has speciation occurred between these two populations? If yes, which reproductive barrier is operating? So go ahead and pause, think about your answer. And when you're ready, push play. So if you said red, no speciation has not occurred, you would be correct. Remember that if those organisms can reproduce and produce fertile offspring, then they are the same species. And so because these two organisms can still reproduce, they're no longer separate, they're, they're not separate species. They're of the same species. And so speciation has not occurred. We have not formed a new species. So when we talk about the mechanisms for speciation, these reproductive barriers arise in two ways, depending on spatial patterns. Allopatric speciation is where the, you don't get contact between the two populations. And so because of their reproductive isolation, they have acquired changes that allow them to no longer breed with one another. Sympatric speciation means that they're still, they're in the same geographical area. They're not geographically isolated, yet there's some reason that they have formed two new species. And we'll talk about some examples of both types. So again, allopatric speciation is where a physical barrier separates the two populations. And that physical separation um, has mutations and changes occurring in the populations, those two populations that don't interbreed. And when you get no gene transfer between the two populations, each proceeds down its own evolutionary line. Each faces its own selective pressures in its environment and therefore different adaptations might arise in those new populations. And when they come back together, they may have acquired new mutations that made them no longer able to reproduce. And so this may then give rise to one or more reproductive barriers. It could be, again, um, it could be a behavioral isolation, so maybe the mating calls different. It could be a gametic change. There are lots of different types of reproductive barriers that could form because two species are geographically separated. For example, we talked about Darwin. Remember when Darwin went on his journey to the Galapagos Islands, one of the things that kind of made him think about natural selection was that when he looked at the organisms on the Galapagos Islands and compared those to the ones that were on South America, he noticed that they were similar, they had some similarities, yet they also had differences as well. And that's because when those species were reproductively isolated, when they were in their own environments, they faced their own selective pressures. And when that happened, they evolved independently and they formed new species, species that if they came back together would not be able to reduce would not be able to reproduce and produce fertile offspring. And so this just shows, okay, so if two species get geographically separated, but they can come back together and the populations can still interbreed, then we would say no speciation has occurred. Right? If they still have the ability to breed, you haven't formed a new species. However, if you get reproductive or if you get spatial isolation, so some geographic barrier, for example, and if now those two populations which are separated, if they have changed enough that they, when they come back together, they cannot uh, breed with one another, then speciation has occurred. They have now formed two independent species. They're no longer um, of the same species. They're reproductively isolated. In sympatric speciations, populations diverge genetically while sharing the same habitat. Uh, there are fish 
that have diversified into several species in a small African lake. Each species of these fish specializes in its unique microenvironment, and this leads to reproductive isolation and therefore speciation. So maybe one lives where there's more oxygen present and another species lives in an area where there's less oxygen available. And so because of this, even though they're in the same habitat, they might still be reproductively isolated and therefore have evolved to be their own independent species. And so that's sympatric speciation. It's speciation that forms even while sharing the same habitat. And so this is just showing you the two mechanisms of speciation. So again, allopatric speciation, where they're geographically isolated. So it might be, you know, um, a mountain that formed, it could be a volcano that erupted, it could be due to migration, but allopatric just basically means that they're in two separate environments, and because of this, they each face their own selective pressures, and they acquire changes that makes them reproductively isolated, so that when they come back, they can no longer breed. In sympatric speciation, there's no physical separation, so they're not geographically isolated. They actually might share the same habitat, yet there are still differences between them so that they are now also reproductively isolated and can no longer breed with one another. And now we have two new species. So both of these methods both form a new species, but one is physically separated through geography and the other is that they're in the same region, but they still become different enough to be reproductively isolated. So now we'll talk about what is the tempo of speciation? Like how does this occur? Is it something that happens very quickly or is it something that takes a long period of time uh, to form a new species? And the answer is, is that there are two contrasting models of the pace of speciation. Um, the gradual model basically means that you get uh, big changes or speciation occur by steady accumulation of many small changes. So over time, the organisms each acquire small changes and eventually they get enough changes so that two new species is formed. On the other hand, there's also what's referred to as the punctuated equilibrium model. And this means that there is there are long periods of little change or equilibrium punctuated by abrupt episodes of speciation. So you might have a quick round of speciation, meaning it happens very quickly, and there are enough changes so that they have now formed two new species. And then you have long periods of time with no changes. And then maybe you get some more changes and you get some new species that way. And so these are the two contrasting uh, modes for the pace of evolution. Now, evolution often can occur uh, quickly following a mass extinction. And so if you think about the dinosaurs, the end of the dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs became extinct, we started to see a big expansion of the types of mammals that formed after that period. And so evolution can occur very quickly um, following a mass extinction and the surviving organisms exploit new resources in that new changed environment. And we're gonna talk about that the early mammals were in fact small insect eating mammals. Once the dinosaurs went extinct, those mammals were no longer nocturnal, meaning that they were only active when the dinosaurs were not, but now they could be active during the day. And we started to see this big expansion in the types of mammals that um, followed that mass extinction. And so the last part of this lecture is going to look at how do we categorize Earth's living things? How do we classify organisms as one type or another? So when we classify organisms, we use what's called taxonomy. And taxonomy is the branch of biology concerned with naming and classifying species and grouping organisms according to a more formal scheme. And the scheme can fit, consists of different levels of classification, each more comprehensive than those below it, right? The most 
most narrowed down form of classification, remember, is the species, because the species is very specific. The members of a species have to be able to breed and produce fertile offspring. And remember that as we go up from there, we get more broad. And again, we'll look at another example of this. But in science, when we go to name Earth species, we use a two name or a binomial nomenclature. The first name is going to be the genus. So for humans, our genus is going to be Homo. And remember, we capitalize the Homo. Our species is going to be sapiens. And our species is going to be lowercase. And we underline the two names separately. And so the second is going to be the species, and the first is going to be the genus. So remember when we talked about in lab classifying living things, the easy way to remember the classification scheme, remember do keep pots clean or family gets sick. The D, which is the most broad classification, again is the domain. And we talked about that currently we use a three domain system. Uh, we have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are made of prokaryotic cells. Domain eukarya has eukaryotic cells. And then we start to get more specific. So the next set of classification would be the kingdom. And so remember that if we're looking in domain eukarya, those are all the eukaryotic organisms. So the fungus, um, the animals, the plants, uh, the protists, those are all types of eukarya. But when we get to kingdom, we get a lot more specific. And so for the kingdom, now we may have the animalia. And so these are going to be your animals. So we have our fish, our worm, our bear, our cat members, um, a butterfly, and um, our mouse. Then we get more specific and we come to the phylum. And in the phylum for this example, the phylum is chordata, the chordates, the ones that have the remnants of a backbone, so what's called a notochord. So the worm is out and the butterfly's out, but we still have the fish, the bear, the, the cat family, and the mouse. We get more specific classification, we get our class, and our class is going to be mammalia, or our mammals, and these are where the females have mammary glands to feed their young. And so notice the fish is out. We get more specific order, and in this case order carnivora, these are the carnivores, so the mouse is out. Then we get to family, and in this case we're looking at family as felidae, or the feline family. Notice these are the cat family, the bears out. Genus, we start to get more specific. Okay, so Felis. Now we're getting the lion out. Then we get to species, and this is the most specific. And so notice now we have our species, Felis, which is the genus name, Domestica, which is the species. And so this is a cat that can breed with more of its own kind and produce fertile offspring. It would not be able to breed with this other member that's now excluded from its species. So question for you, which species of animals are probably most closely related evolutionarily? Red, animals in the same genus. Yellow, animals in the same order. Green, animals in the same family. Blue, animals in the same phylum or purple animals in the same class. So go ahead and pause, think about your answer. If you said red, animals in the same genus, you are correct. Because remember that the, the lower the level of classification, so like a species, for example, are very closely related evolutionarily. They're very similar, which is why they're able to reproduce. When you get to more broad classification, like domain, for example, Organisms in the same domain are very distantly related to one another, right? They diverged a long time ago, which is why they're very separated in terms of their taxonomy. And so the answer would then be red, 
animals in the same genus because genus is the next level up from species. And so organisms in the same genus are gonna be very, very similar and they're gonna be the most closely related evolutionarily. If species was a choice on this list, then you would have chosen species. But out of these choices, the most closely related would be the genus. So the biological discipline of systematics is concerned with establishing degrees of relatedness among both living and extinct species. Systematics establishes evolutionary family trees, or what we call phylogenies, by reviewing various kinds of evidence including radiometric dating, so remember um, a way to basically uh, figure out the age of a fossil, the fossil record, and also DNA sequence comparison. And so based on this evidence, they can then determine the evolutionary relationships among species. Now this group of biology is constantly changing and it's being reworked all the time as we get more and more information. So here's an example of a phylogenetic tree, and this is going to depict evolutionary relationships based on the descent from a common ancestor. And so notice here, birds and dinosaurs are very closely related. They have diverged from one another more recently. They have a common ancestor, so each of these little nodes indicates a common ancestor. And so if you're looking in terms of time, if you go back further in time, they have a common ancestor with the crocodiles. And then those branch here from the lizards and the snakes. Here are the turtles, the mammals, and the amphibians. And so notice that the amphibians are the least related from the birds. They diverged the farthest back in the history of time whereas birds and dinosaurs are very closely related, right? They diverged into separate species more recently. So Linnaeus was a scientist who divided all known forms of life originally between the plant and animal kingdoms. And this prevailed with this two kingdom system for over 200 years. In the mid 1900s, that two kingdom system was replaced by a five kingdom system one that put all the prokaryotes in one kingdom, they called it Monera, and it divided the eukaryotes among the four other kingdoms. And then they quickly realized that that form of classification wouldn't work as well. And that in fact, we needed to have domains which were even more broad, and the prokaryotes were divided into two domains, and the eukaryotes were all put in a, its own domain. So if you look at the three domain classification system, here we have this early common ancestor and notice that this common ancestor diverged into what gave rise to the bacteria and the common ancestor that gave rise to the archaea and the eukarya. And again, remember, even though organisms in the domain archaea are made of prokaryotic cells, just like the bacteria are, notice that if you look at this phylogenetic tree, archaea have more in common with organisms in the domain eukarya than they do with bacteria. And so this evolutionary tree shows that um, type of depiction. And when you look in the domain eukarya, again, it classically was divided into four kingdoms, but again, now the protists are being divided up into multiple kingdoms. So looking at the phylogenetic tree, which two animals are the most closely related? Is it the kangaroo and the beaver, the beaver and the iguana, the duck-billed platypus and the iguana, or the kangaroo and the duck-billed platypus? So again, think about your answer, pause, and when you're ready, push play again, okay? If you said red, the kangaroo and the beaver, you are correct. Notice that they branched the most recently of all of these other groups. And if you look at this particular type of uh, phylogenetic tree, notice that they even have the traits that they use to divide these. So for example, organisms on this side of the phylogenetic tree, the reason they were separated from the iguana 
was because these organisms had hair and mammary glands. This one does not. Gestation is going to separate the duckbill platypus from the kangaroo and the beaver. And then the length of the gestation would separate the beaver and the kangaroo. But notice because those branched the most recently, those are the most closely related. Question two says, what is the common ancestor of the kangaroo and the duckbill platypus? Is it A, B, or C? Again, pause. And when you're ready, turn it back on. If you said B, you're correct. So notice that if you look here, here's the duckbill platypus, here's the kangaroo. And at that node, that's the last common ancestor. So the common ancestor between the kangaroo and the duckbill platypus would be B.